good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? How are you? How are you? Good to see you here today. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you for joining us online this morning. We are so happy that you took time to just be with us. To give God what he is worthy of, and that's honor, glory. We praise the name of Jesus this morning. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for God just being God and being a Lord in our lives. And I thank you for opening doors. Thank you for closing doors. Thank you for healing. Thank you for your touch. God, your spirit fill this place. Your spirit fill us. Overflowing us, God. Because we love you so much. We give you praise this morning. We give you honor. And we give you glory. And all of God's people shouted amen.
more time. And I will be content in every circumstance. Child, you are in love. Cause I know that. Stop. 
places, Lord. Oh, it's better, Lord, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, just one moment in your presence. Oh, it's better, better than a thousand other places, Lord. Yeah. Come on, how many of you searched in the wrong place before? I'm just one moment in your presence. Oh, it's better, better than a thousand places, Lord. Than a thousand other places, Lord. Yeah. Just one moment in your presence. It is better, better than a thousand other places, Lord. You're beautiful, I stand in awe of you, you're beautiful, I stand in awe of you, you're beautiful, Jesus, and I stand in awe. Song of the Redeemed. 
forgiving you are Father apart from you we can't grab hold of that revelation Father we ask for your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us into this truth Lord I know that you're calling every one of us to go deeper with you Father during these 10 days of awe you're causing us to be able to reflect on our relationship with you 
Father, you're causing us to be able to hunger and thirst for more of you. And Father, my prayer is that every one of us will leave the shallows and plunge into the deep to experience the power of your presence. To experience daily refreshing of walking with you. The coolness of being guided hand by hand by our Lord and our God. Father, we love you today. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Help us. Teach us. Show us the fullness of what you have in store and who you are in us and through us. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Listen, give somebody a handshake, a high five, a hug, whatever you feel comfortable with. All during the worship, I, could, I couldn't get away. We had an experience this weekend, that, and I couldn't get away from it. And I kept saying, God, do you want me to share something about that? So then the word came forth, and it was like, oh, man, that's what, that's what it was about. So anyway, one of the, David and I went to, and you can share something if you want to, but I'm going to try to be real quick. But David and I went to, with some friends, to Tampa Bay, and we were out in the water on a boat, which is not our normal thing. And, um, but we got, as soon as we got in the boat, you know, the Tampa Bay is referred to also as the Bay of the Holy Spirit, just like Mobile Bay. And, um, when it was, when it was first named and, um, as soon as we got in the boat, we were with, we were actually with the first people who ever took us to a prophetic meeting. I'm sorry if I cry, but anyway, so it was full of prophetic people. As soon as we stepped foot on the boat, the, the sun says, we're going to have to go a different way because the weather was bad and it was beginning to rain and we're looking out at the sky thinking we probably ought to just stay home. That's not looking good. And so, but we thought, no, no, we're going, we're going. And he says, I'm going to get the GPS out because we've never been this way before. And it was like, he just started falling and I started hearing him. It was like every time I turned around, somebody was saying something that was a prophetic thing. And, and the Lord began to say that I'm going to teach you how to navigate the new season in this experience and so and I'm getting to a point that some of that we all need to hear but um so it's dark it's stormy it, we'd have had to either go into the storm the way that they normally went or we had to go this other way which was a different way that they had never been before so they'd never navigated that and um so my my friend was in the front and she was looking back at us and she was saying whatever you do don't look backwards. Whatever you do, don't look backwards. She said, just look forward, just trust me, just look forward. Which, and it was the word of the Lord. You know, now I could hear it screaming um, that that was the word of the Lord, part of this new season. Um, we got wet. Of course, you know, it doesn't really matter. We're out in a boat, so we get wet. The water's just pounding, pounding, pounding. And then the, the rain stops, and it, and it lifts a little bit. The clouds lift a little bit. But it's still not beautiful out. But the water is just, it's just, what do you call that? Calm. It's just, it's like ice, you know, but it's beautiful. But um, anyway, we just kept looking forward, looking forward. But the thing that he began, we're out in 18 feet water. And then all of a sudden we're in two foot of water and we're stuck in the weeds. Yeah, I'm just, trust me. I don't know how we get into these things, but we're in two foot of water. We're stuck in the weeds. And we're not moving. So they have this long pole, and it's like, well, somebody get the pole. So this happened like tw at least twice, maybe three times. And, and each time we get put, you know, they push and push. And my thought is, I am not getting out in this water. And so, because I'm, th you know, I, anyway, so that was my thought. And so then we are at 18 foot of water. We're going. It's beautiful. The water looks the same as it did 
the whole time, whether we were in two foot of water, whether we were in 18 feet of water. It's beautiful, but it's the same. It looks exactly the same. And then all of a sudden, we're back in two foot of water. But when you look down, there's all these weeds. And it's like, who knew there could be that much weed and that low in Tampa Bay? We're not, we're not anywhere close to the shore. And all of a sudden, this time, we are way deep. We are scraping the bottom. And we are sitting there. And they do everything to get the poles out. They do all the stuff they've been doing. And nothing's working. And I'm thinking, we're fixing to get out of this boat. Because we need to lighten the load, you know. So... <laughs> Anyway, there, so actually, the three of the men are already out of the boat. And so it's like I finally started saying, y'all need us to get out? You need us to get out? Oh, no, no, no. And then all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, we're going to need you to get out. Well, we look over, though, and they push the boat over just a little bit, and there's a sandbar. There's a sandbar out in the middle of Tampa Bay where we were. So we get out, and we stand, in, and I'm standing in about a foot of water in the middle of Tampa Bay, but he made a way. He made so that I didn't have to stand in the weeds. I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to swim and, and tread water the whole time. But, you know, they're pushing and pushing and doing all the stuff. And, and we eventually it gets un, unstuck. But I just kept hearing the Lord say, I'll take care of it. You know, and, I, and so in the middle of Tampa Bay, y'all are better at this than I am as far as, I don't know if there's lots of sandbars. Obviously, it's up and down and up and down and up and down. But one minute you're at 18 feet and the next minute you're standing on a sandbar. But he provided a way and I felt like that's part of what, there's other things he spoke to him about. But I felt like what he wanted to say this morning is even if you're in the middle of an impossible situation, that he will make a way so that even if you're out in the middle, and I, and I felt like it brought it into a place that we can see because, you know, we read the Bible and it's wonderful. But we kind of feel like, well, that was because God was doing all that big stuff back then. But he did it just the other day so that when you're standing in the middle of Tampa Bay and you're, you're stuck in the weeds, that he will take care of getting you out because you can't navigate this new season you really can't navigate any season, but especially this new era, we cannot navigate it by looking. Because I kid you not, that water never changed until after lunch. It got a little choppy after lunch. That water looked just as beautiful and calm as ice. Oh, yeah, that's right. That was another part of the whole point, is it doesn't matter what the water looks like on top. It's what's underneath the water that matters so when it was 18 feet it was good the boat could get through but you know when you get in the weeds and there's going to be some times we're going to get in the weeds and we're going to get stuck in some places and some tight places and some low places and and wherever we are he's going to make a way and he's going to give us the grace to stand and if you got to get out of the boat which he's he likes that stuff he likes you getting out of the boat he's going to give you a place to stand when you get out of the boat. So even if it should be 18 feet, he's going to give you a place. He's going to give you a sandbar. And so I just, I just felt like it was such a picture of what he wanted to say that we need to remember that in this new season, we can't look at what we see. We've got to walk by faith. We've got, we can't look by sight. We can't look behind. <laughs> We've got to look forward and know that even when it looks bad, because I'm going to just tell you, I sort of had to decide, I don't care if it's raining, I don't care how black the sky is, we are going, we are going this day on this boat in the middle of Tampa Bay, we are going, and it doesn't really matter, you know, we didn't realize that, wow, we're the only people out here, well, they all knew probably that it was low tide, you know, and whatever, so we were the only ones there but he made a way. He made a way. And that's what I feel like he wants to say today is that it doesn't matter what situation you're in. Even when you get in the weeds, even if you get stuck, he's going to make a way for you. So. Um, <laughs> Teresa, I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even bother coming up here if it wasn't appropriate after what you say. But wait till you, no, wait till you, when we are praying, you, you just talked about making a way keeping, you know, focused, getting out of the boat. And I thought, we're singing that song, you're beautiful. I, um, I, what's it? I stand in awe of you and about locking eyes. And that's what came to my locking eyes. And the, what the Lord gave me was Peter in the boat. Got to get out of the boat. 
And it's like our own lives. And what you're saying, though, we're in, the, we're in these turbulent times and stuff like that. But see, we're singing the song, you're beautiful. I stand in awe of you. But so we sing it. But there's that other song, I lock eyes with you. And I wish you were still up there to sing that song. Because so many times we're thinking, you're beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And it reminded me of Star Wars. The first one, when they used to be good. And he's going in, you know, Luke's going in for the kill of the Death Star. Who knows what I'm talking about? Who doesn't know what I'm talking about? Might be more appropriate. Oh, my gosh. Somebody show him that first couple movies. And he's going in, you know, boop, 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 but did a thing. And then he locks on. Remember that? He locks on. And he's able to shoot that thing and destroys the Death Star. And what it is, I know I'm just kind of going all over the place, but... He was able to get out of the boat, Teresa, like she's saying, because he locked eyes with Jesus in the, in the storm. They were locking eyes prophetically in that storm. He was in that storm, and he locked eyes. He was the only boat out in the storm, like you said, only boat. And he was able to lock eyes with his maker, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he was able to say, man, you're beautiful. And I can trust you to get out of the boat. My sandbar is right here. And the storm was all around. And he was able to get out. And as long as he kept his eyes locked on Jesus Christ. But see, we're so busy doing what they're doing first before they hit the Death Star. They're kind of, boop, 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 like our life is like that. Morning, work, this, that, problems, the world, everything else. And we got to stop and lock eyes. And then we can get out of that boat and we can walk on the water. But we got to settle down in the storm. So let's lock eyes with the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many of you know God's timing is perfect? You know, last week I preached on leaning into the future. And it's just important for us to be able to forget those things which lie behind and be able to lean into it. And you know what's amazing, and, and if I can just springboard off the analogy that these girls have were given this morning, um, you know, as we lean into this future, one of the things that we will find ourselves in some shallow waters, some uncomfortable areas, some areas that um, where there are some weeds, whatever it may be. But I'm going to tell you something. The days ahead are going to be marked by some divine appointments from the presence of God. Yesterday morning, we had our men's breakfast. And men, if you've not been to our men's breakfast, you are missing out. It was amazing. You know, Kez McCorvey was with us yesterday, and he turned to me afterwards. He said, man, this was incredible. This was just incredible. And he's looking forward to connecting with that every single week. But, you know, um, one of the things that I realized is that the days ahead have to be marked by us keeping, you know, a loose hold of, of what our future looks like. So I walk out of the men's breakfast yesterday, and I looked down on my phone, and, you know, I've got several urgent text messages telling me to be able to call, to call, to call. And so I make a phone call, and I find out that, you know, there's a, a, some, some friends of, of, of Kelly's that are customers that had a funeral yesterday. One of her customers' father passed away, and, and one of her customers' husband passed away. And so I find myself being thrusted into a situation yesterday where I didn't know the man who passed away. But because of COVID and because their minister could not perform the funeral, I had to perform the funeral. And you know what? It could be weeds in our lives. It could be in th areas that are inconvenient, whatever it may be. And let me tell you something. If you've never pre preached a funeral and you've never talked to a family, and you've never met the deceased, and you've got to do all of that in the next two hours, oh, that could be a little uncomfortable. But I, the one thing I recognize is that God is there even in the midst of those weeds to be able to provide a sandbar. So after the funeral yesterday, one of the family members was from um, down south in um, part of a charismatic fellowship, and this funeral was at a Presbyterian church, and walked up to me and said, let me say something to you. It was divinely orchestrated from heaven that you were to do this funeral. See, we've got to come into a season where we're fully embracing what God is doing. We can't allow, um, just because it's, we've never gone this way before, we can't allow the inconvenience of the moment, whatever it may be, to stop us from doing what God has. The days ahead are going to be incredible. It's going to be incredible. And we have to be able to, to, to embrace that. So we're in an incredible season. Last week I told you that on Monday evening, started on the Hebrew calendar, the, um, the Feast of Rosh Hashanah, which literally means the head of the year. So it's their new year. 
But as they head into the new year, they also go through 10 days of introspection known as the 10 days of awe. In Psalms 46, it says, be in awe and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted through the earth. So during these 10 days of awe, you know what it does inside the Hebrew culture? We begin to evaluate our relationship with God. What were some things in the past year that went well? What were some things that we had wanted to be able to do that maybe we didn't do? And what it does is it actually drives us into a closer relationship with him. You know, in, in the Hebrew culture, they literally believe that during these 10 days, God will kind of hide himself. Literally causing you to be able to search for him and to create hunger on the inside, knowing that God wants this upcoming year to be greater than anything before. You see, we're in a season where God is wanting us to begin to experience greatness of who he is. In the Hebrew calendar, we're in the year 5872, which literally means grace for perfection, where our mouth speaks with kingdom authority. You see, God is wanting us to come to a place where we begin to understand who we are and whose we are. You know, good, bad, or indifferent, you're sitting in a, a prophetic church. We, we're in a church where we believe in the fullness of the Spirit of God. We believe in all the gifts of God. We don't believe that any of them have gone away. We don't believe that God has stopped moving. We serve a God of miracles. We serve a God that, that gives gifts unto men. We serve a God that is a right now God. He's an active, moving God. But it's important for us, even in the middle of a boat on a rainy day, to be able to see God in the midst of all of that. Because God uses circumstances to draw us into the deeper things of him. Into the things of what he wants to be able to do inside of our lives. So here we are in these 10 days of awe. And I just want to talk a little bit about the power of consecration this morning. Because during the 10 days of awe, that's literally what is happening. You're choosing to consecrate yourself. You're choosing to be able to allow that, the, the, the intimate times with God to begin to flourish. And, and I too have a, a water story if you let me tell it. You know, I told you that last Sunday that here I was in my pool trying to cool off from working in the yard, trying to be able to do some stuff inside of my pool, clean my pool up, and I'm in chest deep water, and all of a sudden it's like the presence of God came into my pool and God began to minister to me. And I had tears streaming down my face. Well, on Monday I chose, was it Monday? No, it was Friday. I chose to be able to get up and I turned to my wife and I said, I'm taking my, um, my, my jet ski out today and I'm going fishing. And, um, and, she, and she was like, you're going by yourself? I was like, yeah, I'm going by myself. I'm a grown man. <laughs> and so, you know, but, you know, I'm responsible also. So, you know, I texted her, hey, I'm getting into the water now. And I put my, my jet ski in the water. And, and you know, and I sent her some pictures when I was out there. I said, I got to confess to you, um, I'm not alone. And she was like, oh, who are you with? And I shot some pictures. And so I, here, I, here I get out there. And, it's, and once again, the, 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 the gulf was like glass. It, it was as, as calm as, the, as this podium. And I get out there, and all of a sudden, I got dolphin all around me. So I shoot a picture of a dolphin. I saw a total. I said, I'm not alone. I got company. And I shot a picture of this dolphin with the lighthouse behind it. And I'm casting. The first half hour, I'm there, and every cast is like, boom, boom, boom. And they are just busting my bait. And I look, and I got bait fish all around me. And I kid you not, it was very surreal. I reeled my line in, put my hook back onto my pole, and I stuck my pole back in the rod holder. And I just sat there because I knew it was a, a divine moment. You see, we're in a season and a time where God wants us to do some introspection. He wants us to be able to seek him because we, he is going to be found by us. When we choose to be able to consecrate ourselves, when we choose to be able to separate ourselves for the sole purpose of just knowing him and getting to know him in a deeper capacity, he will be found. And we will experience him in ways that we cannot even begin to understand. And so later on, I just chose not to be able to fish that day. It was a perfect fishing day. And you guys that are fishing thinking, man, you idiot. Man, you know, you could have filled the cooler that day, but it wasn't about the filling the cooler. As a matter of fact, I'm a catch and release fisherman. I don't hardly bring any fish back. You know, I like grouper, so and I don't go far enough out to catch grouper. So in the flat waters, I'm not, or shallow waters, I'm not catching grouper. So, you know, I'll catch them and I'll thank the Lord for them and I'll put them right back in the water. But I decided I was going to go exploring. And I spent hours riding in that ski on flat waters, exploring. And my GPS will show you where you're at. And all of a sudden, when I crossed over from Leon County into Jefferson County, it showed me where I was at. But it was just a very special time. And I'm just here to tell you this. You don't have to have a jet ski. You don't have to be out on Tampa Bay. You know, you don't have to be able to ride a mountain bike. You don't have to do anything except just cultivate a heart after him. 
You see, there's several times inside of the scriptures where people consecrated themselves, and, and they consecrated themselves at times where God really met them right where they were at. You remember Moses, he consecrated himself, and he was fasting when God gave him the Ten Commandments. So he didn't just go and say, hey, what's up, God? You got anything for me today? No, Moses was, was preparing himself for what was to come. Moses was preparing himself, he was consecrating himself for, for the interaction that he was going to have with God. You see, we sing this morning that God is so beautiful. And, and for some of us, you know, those are words that come off our mouth, but they don't ever transition from our head to our heart. And that's where the battleground really is. God wants us to understand how beautiful he is. He wants us to understand the greatness of what he has in store for us. But it takes times of consecration. And what's amazing is us Western Christians, we, we don't quite understand that. But when you get around um, um, Hebrew roots and you begin to get around Judaism, because you see it's the same God. You know, when God instructed Moses to be able to set aside times of consecration, it's the same God that tells us to this day that we need to set aside times. And, and I can't understand all of this. I can preach it. I can try to give you a, a greater understanding. You know, it, it, there's something about the Hebrew feasts that God moves miraculously. As a matter of fact, during the, 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 the time of Rosh Hashanah, that, that very given time in the Hebrew culture, they believe whatever you ask for, God will provide it. But I think what happens sometimes is that we get into a, a, a rut or we get into a methodology of, of Christianity. And this is what we expect. You know, we come to church and, man, we love our worship. We love, we love our church. We love interacting one with another. And we come with an expectancy of what we've experienced in the past. We come with an expectancy of this is what we've gotten in the past and this is what the future is going to be able to look like. And, and even though we would not acknowledge that, sometimes our behavior literally speaks that. But when we come with such a level of expectancy, declaring that, God, this is a day that you've made. What is it special that you want to do in this day? Because let me say something to you. God is a God that wants to be encountered. So every single day, he's going to do special things. He's going to do things to be able to, to speak to us. And he can speak to us in a multiplicity of ways. You know, um, the, the, the daughter that Kelly, one of her customers, she doesn't live here in Tallahassee. She lives in um, Montana. And she's invited us several times to go out to Montana. And we've never gone to Montana. But when you get out into that big sky country and you get out there in Montana, it's hard. To be able not to understand that there's a God out there. When you, when you begin to see his handiwork and his craftsmanship, you begin to recognize that we serve a great big God. And I, and I don't know about you, let me just share with you from, from one beggar telling another beggar where I found fine bread. If I'm going through a difficult time, if, if I'm battling some things, and if I feel like the walls are closing in around me, you know what's the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of my house. I may go sit out back. I may get um, at a place down by a river. I may get on my ski, whatever it may be. But I'm going to find a place to get out of the house. I, I got to be able to remove the lid because it's the lid sometimes that will bring in the darkness. It's the lid sometimes that will stop us from dreaming. It's the lid sometimes that will stop us from believing. But when we can get outside, all of a sudden we can see from a different vantage point and we realize, wow, the sun is shining. And you know what, God, you've gotten me through every season of my life. You're going to get me through this season. But I don't want to just get through a season. I want to be used in that season. Because you see, God never wants us just to, to get enough for just ourselves. He never wants us just to be able to have enough to be able to meet just our needs. But he wants to be used by us to be able to share the good news, the love, the beautifulness of who he is to others. So there's times of consecration. You know, there's several times in the scriptures. Remember when Jonah went and cried out against Nineveh? What did Nineveh do? They consecrated themselves. They fasted. They, they chose to be able to seek God because they knew that there was a message of destruction that was coming to them. And you know what? You've heard some, some messages of destruction, you know, that, that's coming to different countries and different parts of the world. But, you know, sometimes if the people will respond a certain way, God will meet them there. What, what does 2 Chronicles say in the, in the seventh chapter? If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways that I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. 
You see, there's a condition that's there. And when we choose to be able to consecrate ourselves, when we choose to set apart a time, and this is the season that God is saying, this is the 10 days of all. I want you to be able to evaluate where your relationship is with me, not for the purpose of beating yourself up and telling you how sorry you are and, and that, you know, if, if, if everybody knew exactly who you were, they would certainly wouldn't let you in the church. No, not from that perspective, but to drive you closer to his beautiful. To realize he loves you with an everlasting love. And there's nothing that we'll do that will stop him from loving us. His love is unconditional. Without conditions. But during these ten days of all, we can see that. You know, it was Paul that had consecrated himself when God began to share with him the assignment for his life. It was Peter that was fasting and consecrated himself on the rooftop when God gave him a vision about taking the gospel to the Gentiles. You see, God will give us great direction and great insight when we choose to consecrate ourselves. So, so, so what does that look like for us? How do we do that? It's choosing to be able to break your cycles, break your patterns. Now listen, can I tell you something? You can be very methodical in your relationship with God. You can get up every morning and spend two hours in prayer. You can get up every single morning and spend two hours in the Word. You can get up every single morning and have a devotional time with God, and it can become very rote. It can become very systematic. It can become a place to where you have great intellectual knowledge, but at the same time, God wants to take that and use it for something even deeper. And that's where choosing to be able to say, Father, break up my routine. Break up that, that fallow ground, that common ground, that area inside of my life that, that, that I may stand on and I may think I'm secure, I may think it's a strong foundation, but that foundation is literally causing me to be dependent upon it. Instead of you. You see, he wants us to be able to come to a place where we begin to consecrate ourselves, where we begin to clear our minds and, and our spirit becomes uncluttered and we begin to see from his perspective. Now, let me just say this to you. How many of you can testify over the last year, year and a half, the things that we've dealt with? We've battled some clutteredness inside of our spirits. We, we, we've battled some areas inside of our hearts. You know, it's real tough that here we're in a decade of the mouth. The decade where God says in, in Psalms 81, to open your mouth and I will begin to fill it. We're in the decade of the pay, which in the Hebrew culture is that number 80. And here we're at a time where we're supposed to be opening our mouth, at a time where we're supposed to be speaking the word of the Lord. We're supposed to be used by him to be able to usher in his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And they're telling us to shut our mouths and put a mask on, trying to, to dictate when we can meet and when we can't meet. And it can breed frustration inside of your heart. You know, there, there are times where I pick and choose what media I'm going to be able to listen to and how much I'm going to listen to it. You know, this morning I hated even getting up on Facebook because of just how terrible our, our, no, our um, Seminoles did last night. And I just knew, now, now listen, I'm not taking a shot at them, but I just knew that there was going to be some violent fans that were going to be voicing their opinions. And I was like, man, I don't even want to look at that mess. It's a sport, people. Come on, now it's a sport. Now, now, certainly we like it when, when our hometown boys win, but at the same time, my joy is not found in athletics. My joy is not found in the football team. My joy is found in him. But God wants us during these times of consecration to be people that pray. And I ask God to begin to open up their, their, their eyes, their, their, their natural eyes and their spiritual eyes to begin to see from God's perspective. I just want to share with you just a few principles today, and we're going to take communion. We're going to enter into a time of consecration. For some of you, you may turn and say, well, Pastor, I didn't know anything about any days of awe. I'm just in awe that you're talking about it. And you know what? And, and I, but I'm ready. You know what? You know, just like the, the landowner that hired people the first of the day at noonday and at the end of the day, all of them got the same pay. So you can turn right now to be able to say, listen, you know what? I know we're already six days into this, ten days of awe. We only got four days left, but I'll take these next four days. I'll take this time and let God speak to me. I want to be able to deal with some of this junk that's on the inside or some of the areas inside of my life with him where I feel like I'm falling short or some areas where I've stopped believing where he wants me to believe, where I've stopped moving in faith and I've kind of let some fear begin to creep in, where I've stopped moving by faith and I'm moving more by sight. So there's several places inside the scriptures where I believe that God wants us to be able to deal with. But number one, I just want to talk to you about Hagar. And Hagar was at a very desperate place inside of her life. You remember Hagar? She was the, the woman that, that um, Abraham and Sarah compromised with. You know, God told Abraham that he was going to give him a son. Or he was going to give him a child and, and told Sarah she was going to be able to have a, a, a child. And it didn't quite happen the timing that they thought. Anybody ever 
get a word from the Lord and it doesn't quite happen when you thought, that was them. And, you know, and so all of a sudden, what do they do? They want to try to help God out. So Sarah turns and says, hey, listen, I got my handmaiden here. Um, um, Hagar, she's a good-looking woman now. And you know what? If you'll go in and lay down with her, she'll give you a baby, and hey, that'll be the fulfillment of what God had said. You'll still have a son. And, 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 and so Abraham said, hmm, sounds good to me. So he went in and he did that. And all it was was a son of compromise. And so when, when, when Isaac comes along, all of a sudden now the son that he had through Hagar, Ishmael, they can't stay there. Because here they've got a son to compromise, and they've got the son that God had promised them. So Abraham and Sarah, they put um, Hagar out. They send her out in Genesis chapter 21. And the Bible says in verse 15 that, the, that she had water with her, and they send her out into the desert. And when the water was all used up, she thought she was going to die. And she placed Ishmael, the boy, under one of the shrubs. And she went, the Bible says, a bow shot away so that she would not hear him suffering as he died. She did not want to hear her boy whimpering. She did not want to be able to hear his cries as the life began to ebb out of him. Verse 17, the Bible says that God heard the voice of this lad. God heard the boy's cries. During a time of consecration, it's important for us to understand that God hears the cries of children. God hears the, tr the cries of our children. Even when the Bible doesn't say that Ishmael was a God-fearing child, the Bible doesn't say that Ishmael loved God with all of his heart, but in a time of desperation, God heard his cries. And so God speaks to, 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 to um, um, Hagar, and, and, and God opened up her eyes, and she saw something that was there all along, but she couldn't see it before. It was a well. And from that well, she drew water, that gave nutrients to her and to the boy. You see, I believe there are times of consecration, there are some things that have worried us, and some of the things that may have worried us may have been, may, might have been our own children, might have been our own family members, could have been some of our good friends, could have been some family members and, you know, that, 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 are, that are distant, that are not necessarily here, that are not living the way they need to be able to live. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we can give up on how God works and how he operates. But I believe through the story of Hagar, we can see that God not only will open our eyes to things that we never saw that was there, opportunities, situations that God is, is moving in. You know, I'm the youngest of seven in my family. I've got five sisters and a brother who is no longer with us. And, um, and, and I've got some sisters that, you know, sometimes don't live right. Anybody have some, some siblings that don't live right? Don't do right? I'll put my sisters up against yours anytime. If you ever have any sisters that got somebody else on a, on a call and, you, and they have a three-way call and they get you on the call, and so you don't know that the third person's on the call and they're trying to get you to say something about them just to be able to cause problems inside of the home. I'm telling you what, they're, old, they're older than me, but they're much younger than me. And, and you know, and, but you know, the thing that I have to be able to recognize is that God is not limited to me. God is not limited to my advice. God is not limited to my ability to be able to talk to these girls and to be able to lead them to a place where they accept Christ and begin to allow that transforming power to happen with inside of them. You see, just like Hagar that was there, and all of a sudden she saw something that she never knew existed, that well, that place of nourishment, that, that, that place that was going to be able to give her what she needed to sustain her life, she never saw it until God opened up her eyes. And the thing that I recognize that during times of consecration, I begin to see the hand of God. I realize that God doesn't just need me, just like Elijah, that, that turned to God and he said, God, I'm the only prophet left in Israel. I'm the only one that is still here that has is, that is not bowed their knee to Baal. And God's like, excuse me, I've got 7,000 other prophets that you know not about. You see, that's what times of, 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 of consecration will do. It will enable us to see not just our perspective, but from God's perspective. Because God is, is, is multi, he has, he has, he has multiple ways to be able to reach our children, to reach that situation, to be able to reach people that we thought were unreachable. You know, the guy with the microphone today, there was times where people thought that I was unreachable. They thought that my life was so messed up in the direction that I was going in that even God couldn't reach me. 
Don't ever come to a place where you think that somebody is so far gone that God can't reach them. But during times of consecration, you know what happens? We begin to open up our heart and we begin to realize, God, I have boxed you in. I have put a lid on you. I have put, you know, a, 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 a capacity on you saying you can't do something. And God sits in the heavens and he laughs. I'm telling you, times of consecration cause us to begin to, to have our eyes open so that we begin to see the provision of the Lord. We begin to see things that we never saw before. We begin to recognize that he is our provider. That he will provide whatever we may, meet, we may need. It could be family members. It could be salvation. It could be finances. It could be health. Whatever it is. Con times of consecration enables us to be able to see the fullness of who God is. Here we're singing about how beautiful God is. And for some of us, if we're not careful, our ability to articulate what something beautiful is could be very limited. But the more that we seek him, we begin to realize how vast his beauty really is. And the only place that we're limited is inside of our own hearts. There's another person inside of the scriptures, you, you know him, a man by the name of Balaam, to where God had told him not to do something, but he chose to do it anyway. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's fixing to talk about you right now. You ever been there? God ever told you to do something and you chose not to be able to do it? So here all of a sudden, Balaam, God told him, he said, do not go this way. Well, Balaam gets a little bit of pressure, and as a result, he gets up and he goes and does exactly what God tells him not to be able to do. And here in the midst of him choosing to be able to rebel against God, all of a sudden, the donkey in which he's riding turns and sees an angel, and the donkey chooses, he pulls back, he's not going to be able to go because he knows that angel is going to be able to kill him and kill the prophet. And all of a sudden, here's Balaam. In the midst of disobedience to God. And what is he doing? He's taking that whip and he's whipping that donkey. Because that donkey's not doing what he wants him to be able to do. And here he doesn't even realize the thing that he's whipping is the thing that's protecting him. And all of a sudden God opens up the mouth of the donkey. You know you're in trouble when your pets start talking to you. <laughs> he opens up the mouth of the donkey and the donkey turns to him and says, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And all of a sudden, God opened up the prophet's eyes, and the, and the prophet saw an angel standing in the path. And the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and when he saw the angel standing in the path with his sword drawn in his hand, he bowed his head, fell flat on his face before the Lord. See, times of consecration will show us at times, family. Listen, all I'm, I'm just sharing with you where I, where I live and what flows out of me and what flows through me. I'm not, I'm not just preaching to you. This is, this is what God is doing on the inside of me. Times of consecration will show us the areas that we're hard-headed. The areas where we've got to have it our own way. The areas where, where we think that we're doing what, what, what is good, but it's not God. The areas that all of a sudden, you know, we're fighting against what God is wanting to do. Some things God is wanting to get out of our hands. There's some people that God wants to get out of your life. And the reason he wants to get them out of your life is because those people are destructive individuals. And the things that they're saying and the things that they're doing, they're destroying you. They're destroying your future. They're destroying what God wants to be able to do in you and do through you. And, and sometimes we want to hold on to them because our identity is in them. But we, we want to hold on to them because we think that our future is, is connected to them. Let me say something to you. Your future is connected to God. And the people that God has you connected with are people that are going to complement what it is that he wants to be able to do. But sometimes we can hold on to people more than we can hold on to God. You know, uh, you've heard me say that I hold on to people loosely and I hold on to God tightly. Because I recognize I've got one life to live. And in that life that I'm living, I want to see thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I recognize that we're moving into one of the greatest seasons. And let me just say this to you. Without going into too much information, if you'll take these 10 days of all, if you'll take this time of consecration, if you'll really seek the Lord, I believe the month of October, there's going to be some things that are going to open up your eyes and open up your mind. You're going to realize that God's got some surprises coming to you in the month of October. There's going to be some things that he's going to do that you would have never seen, just like that well with Hagar, just like this angel with, with, with Balaam, that if you're not choosing to be able to consecrate yourself and just say, God, and listen, I'm not talking about being super spiritual. You know, you don't have to be able to go and, 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 and create some elaborate, you know, um, sanctuary inside of your home where you can just commune with God. I'm talking about redirecting your heart towards him. I'm talking about shutting this and opening up these. Being quick to listen and slow to speak. By doing that, God will give us great direction. 
He'll give us great creativity. I, I believe that during this, 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 this season that we're going into, God is going to open up some things inside of our hearts and our, inside of our minds that's going to give us some great creativity. Some of you, I believe, have the capacity to be able to move into areas that you never thought you could have moved into. And how many of you know all it takes is one thought? All it takes is one idea? All it takes is one download from heaven and all of a sudden you see something that you never saw before and as a result, now it opened up a door, it opened up a key, it opened up a treasure box that you never even knew existed. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, that the willing and the obedient shall eat of the good of the land. Times of consecration causes us to be willing and obedient. Times of consecration causes us to enable our hearts to be soft and pliable. You know, I, I, I wish that we served a God that I could just get systematic with. It would be so much easier, wouldn't it, to be able to know that this is what we've got to do and this is the way we've got to be able to do it. And if we'll do it this way and, and, and make sure that we're hitting all of the points and, and we're making sure that we're putting in the time, that everything is good. You know what that is? That's the law. And the law wants to be able to give us rote behavior. The law wants to give us systematic behavior. The law wants us to be able to say, you got 10 points, and if you'll do 10 points, then you'll be accepted by God, but you only did nine today, so God doesn't love you. See, that's the law. It, it condemns us, and it, and it stops us from, from reaching the fullness of who we are in him, but in God, when we consecrate ourselves, you know what he does? He overwhelms us with his goodness. How does the song go? His goodness is running after me. That's our God, and that's the joy that he has for our lives. And we've got to come to a place where we begin to see that and begin to recognize that. You see, I think that God wants to be able to show us at times where we're going in the wrong direction. Sometimes we can have the right motives and still be going in the wrong direction. Sometimes we may be connected with the wrong people, and they're taking us in the wrong direction. But we think, God, I love you, and I want to do what you want me to be able to do, but not realizing that sometimes the, the, the crowd is taking us in the wrong direction. But God wants to be able to open up our eyes. And enable us to be able to see from, from his perspective. You know, what I love is, I mentioned him last week with Elisha. And just the divine protection that surrounded him. It was something that Elisha understood. And he understood that from times of consecration. You know, Elisha asked for a double portion of Elijah's anointing. Elijah performed seven major miracles. And Elisha in his lifetime performed 13. Close, but not double. But you remember it was Elisha that after he passed away, they had him buried inside of a, a cave, a tomb. And the Bible records that there was a funeral procession that was coming along. And as the funeral procession was coming along, the, these bandits came. And all of a sudden, the people that were a part of the funeral profession, I mean, uh, procession, they got a little nervous. And what did they do? They abandoned the dead man because the dead man, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have known anyway. So they threw the dead man inside of this cave where Elisha was. And the dead man's body touched the bones of Elisha and immediately came back to life. This was the man that operated through a lifestyle of consecration and recognized that there was more with him than those that were against him. So let me just say something to you. Times of consecration will really open up your eyes. It, it will enable you to be able to see things from heaven's perspective, and it will enable you to understand that God is for you, and if God is for you, who can be against you? Why do we fear? Why do we worry? Because we think this season, this situation, these individuals are going to be the end of me. And that's what fear does, false evidence appearing real. It gets us to believe something that we see with our eyes. And that's why the Apostle Paul says that we walk by faith and not by sight. So the greatest obstacle to faith is not fear, but it's sight. But what consecration does is it stops us from relying upon what we see. I am so thankful that I had people praying for me back when I was a young teenager, young adult. That they didn't give up on me, even though their eyes were seeing a boy that was a mess. Even though their eyes saw somebody that was constantly running with the wrong crowd. They didn't give up on me because they knew that there was a God in heaven. And as long as they prayed, God was still working. And God met me right where I was at. What I love about Elisha is that he understood divine protection. Consecration opens up our spiritual eyes. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, our natural eyes sometimes will get us to be able to see the wrong thing. Our natural eyes may see a season in somebody's life, but God sees the finished book. 
The natural eyes may see a chapter of struggle where God sees a, a, a heart that is completely healed and sold out to him. We've got to come to a place where we realize that, that we cannot allow sight to dictate our faith. We've got to choose to be able to put God first. God wants to open up our eyes. He wants to open us to a place to where we understand his provision, his direction, his protection over our family, over our finances, over our life. How many of you know that God's got a call for your life? Do you realize that? Every one of you have a call on your life. It may not be to hold a microphone. It may be able to be a contractor. It may be to work for, for um, um, a, a state employee or appointment. Whatever it may be, God's got a call for us. And we've got to connect with that call. We've got to connect with what he's calling us to do. Sometimes what can take place is we want to dictate terms. Well, God, if you got a call for my life, this is the way it's got to be. And, 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 and you know what? And, and I, I checked today in heaven, and there's some opportunities that are available in foreign lands. How many of you want to sign up to be missionaries? And my missionary friends got to put their hands down because they already committed to that a long time ago. But you know, the thing is, is that sometimes we want the things that we want. But a part of consecration, what it does is it says, God, I choose to lay down my life. I choose to lay down my thoughts, my wants, my desires to allow something greater to begin to surface and begin to affect who I am. He wants us to come to a place where we're seeking him, to open our eyes, to recognize that he is providing for us. Come and help me, Johnny. I can't wait to go back to Israel. Part of the next tour that I'm going to do is we're going to walk on the road to Emmaus. Here all of a sudden we have some disciples that are walking. It's the Passover. The tomb is empty. Jesus is raised. And they're going back home. They have fulfilled their obligation to be able to be in Jerusalem for the Passover. They just had the Seder the night before. They had made sacrifice. They brought offerings. And they're heading back home. And they're talking amongst themselves about the one that was crucified. But they don't know that he was raised from the grave. And all of a sudden in the 24th chapter of the book of Luke, it says that as they were walking, Jesus drew near them and started walking with them and started talking with them. And as they got close to their home there in, in, in Emmaus, all of a sudden they bid him to be able to stay with them because he said he had to be able to travel on even further. And, um, and so they, 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 they asked him to be able to come in, to be able to stay the night with them, to be able to dine with them. He agrees to be able to come in. And all of a sudden, it's time to be able to eat. He breaks the bread. He gives thanks to the Lord, and their eyes are open. Boom. And they realize this is Jesus. This is the one that they were talking about on the road. This is the one that they loved but they saw the limitation. And during this time, God removed the limitation to enable them to see an aspect of him that was there all along, but they couldn't see it. <laughs> I love verse 32. That after they realized it was Jesus, he was taken from them. And they considered their conversation, but their conversation was much different this time. In verse 32, it says, they said one to another, did not our hearts burn while he talked with us on the road and while he opened up the scriptures to us? See, that's what times of consecration will do. It will literally cause you to be able to be set on fire. Your heart will begin to burn on the inside of you as the Holy Spirit begins to reveal the scriptures to you. As the Holy Spirit begins to re reveal to you an aspect of God that is so much greater than maybe what you've understood right now. Let me say something to you. I've been walking with God for, since 1985. That's a long time. And every day it seems like the Lord is teaching me new aspects of who he is. You know what I realized? This side of heaven, it doesn't matter how many degrees I have. It doesn't matter how many books I've written. All it matters is that I continue to seek him. All it matters is that I never grow satisfied. I never feel like that, wow, okay. You know, you just mentioned some, some, some passages inside the scriptures. Yeah, I've read them. I know all that. Why are you talking about something I already knew? Because like the rabbis say, the word of God goes 70 layers deep. And there's revelations inside of the word of God that we'll never see until we consecrate ourselves. 
And so we seek him with all of our heart. Do we set aside times? Do we shut off that crazy phone? And we choose to be able to seek him with all of our heart, saying, God, this is your time. I'm not going to let that crazy dinger telling me I have notifications and go off to distract me. But Holy Spirit, you're like a ready writer. Write upon the tablets of my heart and begin to do something on the inside of me. See, he wants us to have times of visitation like the boys on the, the road to Emmaus. He wants us to be able to draw closer to him in prayer. He wants us to be like the Apostle Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus where it says that the eyes of their understanding were, were being enlightened. He wants us to be able to grow closer to him and to see the greatness of who he is. He wants us to be able to have hope, faith, and love and to recognize that it's only through him that we can move into that. So we're going to turn and we're going to take communion and I'm going to pray a prayer over you. I'm going to pray that whether you've been consecrating yourself for the first six days or if this is your first day, you're going to start. Can I say something to you? <laughs> I don't want to scare you. But where you are is going to determine how you're going to respond in the days ahead. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to be able to realize there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. There are things that are happening right now that nobody would have ever imagined it could have happened. There are things that are taking place right now that if I would have turned to you 10 years ago and I would have told you that this is going to happen, you would have said there is no way possible. You see how they're taking statutes, statutes down all across America? Some of the statutes that they're taking down they're going to turn and they're going to tell us those white supremacists, those racists were some of the same ones that wrote our Constitution. We need to revise it. And if you don't think that they're not coming after our liberties, they're coming after our liberties. Now, I didn't say that to scare you. I said that to prepare you. Because what you do right now is what anchors your soul. What you do right now is what determines whether the wind is going to be able to beat you back and forth or whether you're going to be able to stand strong. Because listen, you know, there are things that happen inside of our lives that we can't control. The only thing we can control is our position and the way that we stand. And if, and if our relationship with God is in the shallow end of Christianity, if we have a real shallow root systems, it don't take much to be able to upset that. It will not take much to be able to topple those trees and, and to be able to really upset the, the apple cart inside of our lives. And I believe that that's why God has spotlighted around the world. This is that time. Evaluate where you're at. Tell them that you've got to have more. This is the one that stepped out onto the edge of nothing, people. It said, let there be and created the universe. This is the one that, that the Bible says that he formed and fashioned you and put gifts inside of you for the purpose that you have ahead of you. This is the one that wants you to understand how beautiful he is and allow that beauty to splash over onto you. To allow your confidence to grow stronger in him. To understand how accepted you are, how loved you are. That his tender mercies are new every morning. That there is no, no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. That you can walk with him, you can talk with him. You can experience the fullness of the kingdom of God because he has provided all of that for you. That he's done away with the, with the law, the legalism. He's allowed you to be able to enter his presence with grace and with mercy. This morning we're going to take communion together and I've got little souvenir cups for you made out of olive wood. These cups have come from Bethlehem. But the one who paid it all was nailed to a cross made of olive wood. And I want you to take these cups home with you. These cups came from Bethlehem came from a really close friend of mine who gave them to me, did not charge me for them, gave them to me, and said, I want you to be able to give these to your congregation. And as you give them to your congregation, I want your congregation not only to be able to receive what God has done for them, but I want your congregation to remember Bethlehem, the place where Jesus was born, the place where David was raised as a shepherd boy. The place where the shepherds had an angelic visitation from God. The place where the lambs that were sacrificed in the temple were raised. It was the only place that they would accept the lambs to be sacrificed in the temple was from Bethlehem. Today, their Christian population is under 2%. Muslims have infiltrated Bethlehem, trying to institute Sharia law and completely run Christianity out of Bethlehem. So whether you set this on your mantle, whether you use it to be able to take communion with your family, whatever it may be, I want you to remember your brothers and sisters 
that are choosing to be able to stay in a situation to allow light to begin to go forward. You know what? There's missionaries right now in Afghanistan that refuse to leave. We're thinking, man, you need to get out. Come on, you need to protect yourself. And they're like, protect myself. I died a long time ago. I came here for the purpose of letting the light shine. I came here for the purpose of bringing the hope of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to these Afghan people. And I'm not leaving. I, when I came here, I died to myself a long time ago. And if I die here, so be it the Lord. If I live here, so be it the Lord. See, I think God wants to toughen us up. I think he wants us to be able to get a deeper root system. He wants us to be able to, to realize that there are deeper things in God. If we continue to look over our shoulder and we continue to rehash the past, that's where we'll live. But God says, no, forget those things which lie behind and press forward. We're going to use matzah today. For many people, they don't understand matzah. You know, it's Jewish bread. I know they use it when they make matzah ball soup. And, but let me tell you about matzah bread. It ha does not have any leaven in it, so it's unleavened bread. And the Jews were commanded to be able to have unleavened bread. They were, choo they were commanded not to have bread made out of leaven, which represented sin. But you know what's amazing is that on this piece of matzah, there are some stripes. As a matter of fact, there's 39 stripes on this piece of matzah. And there are piercings on this piece of matzah. Jewish people can't tell you why. That's just the way they make it. There's nothing symbolic. There's nothing special about it. Well, as Christians, we realize our Lord and Savior took 39 stripes. And we realize he was pierced. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was wounded or pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are made whole. He took our, our infirmities, and he bore our sickness. He took the weakness inside of our bodies, the weakness inside of our minds, the weakness inside of our hearts, the weakness from our commitments to him. And he bore that on Calvary's cross. That's why he says there's therefore now no condemnation in Christ. So you turn to me today and you're like, Pastor, yes, tonight I'm going to set aside time to be able to consecrate myself before God. And I'm going to do it every evening before I go to bed because this is my desire. And you may do it tonight and tomorrow night and then Tuesday night the phone may ring and, you know, and somebody wants to go to dinner with you and you forget to do it. Well, the enemy wants to be able to come and bring condemnation. But because of what Christ has done, we have no condemnation. And we recognize God. Though a righteous man stumbles seven times, he rises again. I choose to get up and continually consecrate myself before you, even if I fall short. So he was sacrificed, crucified on Calvary's hill. Let me share with you one last thing, and then we're going to take communion together. I'm going to ask David and Mike to be able to help me. As, as a matter of fact, if you gentlemen will come up right now. I'm going to let them serve you in your seats. I'm going to let you grab that tra both of those trays, David. Mike, I'm going to ask you to gra grab both of those trays. Be careful. They're full. Bob wanted to make sure that you got every drop possible. David, if you'll serve this side, Mike, if you'll serve this side. Yep, go ahead. I'm going to continue as they're serving you. See, nothing happens inside of God's kingdom without being divinely orchestrated by God. I could have never fathomed that God would have opened up my eyes to the truth of why he says some of the things that he says. In the book of Exodus, God commanded Moses to take two lambs every single day continually to sacrifice one lamb at the beginning of the day, to sacrifice another lamb at the end of the day. Those lambs are called a tamid which literally means that they are being sacrificed for the people. So every morning they would make a sacrifice, they would blow the trumpet, and they would open up the temple. In the evening they would make a sacrifice, they would blow the trumpet, and they would close the temple. Every day continually, 365 days a year, they sacrificed one in the morning, one in the evening. In the Jewish culture, their hours are a little bit different than ours. In the Jewish culture, their day started with that first sacrifice at 9 o'clock in the morning. They would sacrifice the lamb and they would open up the temple. They would take care of all of their ceremonial responsibilities throughout the course of the day. 
And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they would sacrifice another lamb and they would close the temple. Well, we know our Savior, who died on Calvary's cross, nailed to an olive wood cross, was the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. So if God instructed that an actual lamb would be sacrificed every day for the sins of the people, would he not have something similar for Christ? Scriptures tell us that Jesus was crucified on the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning. At the same time that the trumpet was blasting from the temple, that they were sacrificing a lamb in the temple, they were, they were crucifying Jesus on the cross. Because what God says, God will perform. His promises are yes and amen. What he tells us, he will accomplish. And so when he instructed Moses, Moses, every single day this has to happen, he had to allow his son that was sent from heaven to earth that his blood would be shed for the remission of sins for the lives of his people. Most who were crucified would stay on the cross for days. They don't die from the nails. They die from asphyxiation. As their body begins to lose blood, fluid begins to build up with inside of their lungs and they have difficulty breathing. The nail between their feet is their only way of escape. They would press on that nail, pushing up their body against the excruciating pain from that nail, only to be able to draw oxygen into their lungs. And because of the weight of their body, they would find themselves dropping back down, still being suspended between heaven and earth until they had to be able to get another breath. Josephus writes that some would stay on the cross for four or five days going through this process. But God had a different plan. He had a plan that he laid out in Exodus 29 to Moses. And all of a sudden, the Passover was coming. And the Jewish um, leaders knew that they could not have bodies on the cross during Passover because it went against their laws. So they turned to the Romans and they said, listen, can you, can you um, a, a, ca cause this whole process to be able to be expedited, to, to help them? And so they would come and they would break the legs of those that were being crucified. So they could not push themselves up. So the death would come quickly because they had no oxygen coming inside of their lungs. And they come to Jesus and they realize that they didn't need to break his legs. Because prophetically, God already spoke inside of his word that he would not have a broken bone. The suffering Messiah would not have a broken bone. And here all of a sudden the trumpet blasts. And they're sacrificing a lamb in the temple for the closing of the day. It's at 3 o'clock. The very time that Jesus gave up his spirit and he died. Let me just say that to you. Say something to you. I, I shared this with you. Because our God is not a small G God. Our God is not some philosophical God. Our God is not somebody that we talk about that's somewhere out there in the cosmos and one day we'll have an opportunity to be able to meet him. Our God sticks closer than a brother. Our God will never leave us nor will he ever forsake us. Our God loves us with an everlasting love. And I believe that God enables us to be able to understand the, the, the depth of his love so that we can understand how much he loves us. If he takes time to very count the very hairs of head upon our head, if a sparrow does not fall to the ground without him being aware of it, we've got to come to a place where we go deeper in his love, where we begin to recognize that his love is amazing. That's why I love studying. That's why I love going to Israel, because I learn aspects of my heavenly father that I would never have learned from a western mindset. I learned aspects of why God does what he does and how he does it by choosing to go deeper in my faith. That's what consecration will do for you. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand to your feet. I'm going to pray a prayer over you. After I finish praying, I'm going to ask Johnny to sing something. So if Johnny, you need the rest of the worship team, they can go up there also. And then I want you to be able to take communion when you're ready.
We do have to be able to leave here by one o'clock. But when you're ready, I want you to consecrate yourself right now to God. I want you to be able to say, Father, I'm moving into one of the best seasons of my life. It's not based upon what I see. Because I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. It doesn't matter if I'm in the deep water or the shallow water. It doesn't matter if it happens the way that I thought it was going to happen. Or if God, if you have a totally different plan, whatever it is, I want it. I want it. I want to experience the fullness of who you are. I want to experience the power of your resurrection. I want the hope of the glory of God to manifest itself inside of me and through me to this world. My greatest prayer for you is that during this time of consecration, that you would move out of a me mentality and move into a the mentality. That it would no longer be about, God, I'm seeking you so that I can have this, this, and this. But God, I'm seeking you so that I may know you and the power of your resurrection to make you known to those that are around me. Make no mistake, our Heavenly Father is a God of love. That love is what propelled him to leave his seat in heaven, his throne in heaven and come to earth for the world. So that all would know him. He uses us to reflect his love to them. So, Father, I thank you for everyone of the sound of my voice as well as our brothers and sisters that are watching online. I pray that you find something there inside of your house, your juice, your bread, whatever it may be, and you begin to turn your home, you turn your living room into a sanctuary where you begin to consecrate yourself before God. You may be in, at work. You may be in your automobile. I pray that you pull over and just begin to allow the Spirit of God to be able to invade your cab your car to encounter him in the power of his resurrection Father Lord we just ask Lord that during these 10 days of all Father Lord you've not called us to convert to Judaism you've called us to be able to seek you with all of our heart and Father Lord just like you spoke to the children of Israel Father you still speak to us that there are times that we seek you with all of our heart. So, Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice as well as those that are online. And, Father, Lord, I declare and decree that we're in that season of consecration. We're in that time, Father, Lord, where, you, Lord, you are moving in the earth. So, Father, Lord, I ask, God, that you would move inside of the hearts of your people. The Holy Spirit, that you begin to meet them right where they're at. That as they consecrate themselves before you, that God, that they would experience your power, they would experience your love, that they would experience your plan. And that, Father, Lord, that they would surrender themselves to you, not, not for um, a perspective that's going to take anything from them, but from a perspective that you want to give everything to them. So, Father, I ask that right now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would begin to give them fresh revelation, fresh illumination, fresh insight. Draw them, Father Lord. Cause the hunger inside of them to be able to grow greater. Father Lord, may their hearts burn from your presence and from your power. May they understand the fullness of who you are and the purpose that you have for their lives. We love you today. Father Lord, you've instructed us that as frequently as we do to partake in communion and remembrance of you. Father, we thank you for your love that was displayed on Calvary's hill. It was not the nails that held our Savior to that cross. It was his love. We know that at any given time, he could have called legions of angels to come down and pull him off of that cross and decimate the entire Roman Empire. But it was the love that you have for us. It's the love that you have for the people of this world that held him to that cross. And Father, as we partake in communion, we thank you for the blood. The blood, God, that cleanses us from all iniquity. We thank you, Father Lord, for the healing power that, Lord, based upon the stripes that Christ took upon his back, that, Father Lord, our sickness and our infirmities, Father Lord, cannot stand where the blood is applied. So, Father, right now, God, we apply the blood 
to everyone's body, to everyone's mind, to their souls. Father, I declare right now that any wounds inside of their souls that have held them back from believing, God, that you love them with an everlasting love, Holy Spirit, begin to pour in the oil and the wine to help them experience the fullness of who you are. Father, in the, in the book of Mark, it says that these signs will follow those that believe. That, Father, Lord, they would pick up deadly snakes and drink deadly poison and would not harm them. Father God, we pray for those, Father Lord, that are dealing with the poison of this COVID. And Father God, we declare that, that God healing is coming to their bodies. Father Lord, if there's any poison that's inside of their bodies, Father God, right now through the power of the blood of Jesus, we just declare, God, that you're causing your cleansing to come, Father Lord, all the way down to the cellular level, that, Father Lord, no weapon formed against them will prosper, that, that, Father Lord, no trickery is going to be able to stop them from reaching their full potential in you. So, Father God, we declare, God, that your blood is stronger than any virus. Your blood is stronger than any type of, 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 of remedy. Your, your, your blood is stronger than anything, Father God, that the enemy can try to be able to bring. And, Father Lord, we apply the blood of Jesus today. And Father God, we ask, Lord, that your healing would be your children's bread. Touch their bodies. Touch their lives. We give you all the honor and we give you all the praise. Johnny, do you got a song? When I log eyes with you. Yes, God. I see my reflection when I log eyes with you. Feel your affection. I love to get lost in you. Cause you're my obsession when I lock eyes with you. Cause all I want is you. As you take communion, I want you to take all that God has into you. The Bible says that it's Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. That word glory is the Greek word doxa, which means all that he is and all that he has. So it's Christ in you, the hope of all that he is and all that he has. I want you to receive that into you. And I want you to be able to literally give back to him. Say, Father, all that I am and all that I have is yours. No longer will it be about me, but it's about thy kingdom come and thy will be done. You can partake. Go ahead, Johnny. All I want you.
Just you, just you. Cause you're beautiful. I stand in awe of you. You're beautiful. I stand in awe of you. You're beautiful. Oh, I stand. Nothing more beautiful than you never been, there'll never be nothing more beautiful than you. There's never been, then never be nothing more beautiful, beautiful. I stand in awe. I stand in love you. you are, 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 you are. You know, I'm thinking right now, as the Apostle Paul said, as eye has not, eye has not seen it, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, what God will do for those that love him. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it even entered into our heart. So as we're talking about how beautiful he is, when we talk about consecrating ourselves before him, when we talk about the greatness of who he is, it's a learning process, people. We're going to move from glory to glory to glory. We're going to move from understanding to more understanding to more understanding. Never stop. Never stop. I got one little bit of housekeeping. A couple weeks ago, you guys gave to be able to feed some people that were displaced over in um, um, Louisiana. They went to... um, um, a small neighborhood, Harvey, Louisiana, right outside of Louis, right outside of Baton Rouge. No, excuse me, right outside of New Orleans. And in two days, fed 4,600 people. In two days. He turned and Keith Whitfield, who some of you know because he's one of our chaplains, we share your heart. He heads up Mana Express. Not a dime of the money that went goes to any administration. There's no salaries or anything. He turned and he said, Pastor, every meal we ran out. One day for lunch, they cooked a 1,000 hamburgers. You ever cook a 1,000 hamburgers? They cooked a 1,000 hamburgers, and the line still was there. Fortunately, the night before, they smoked, I don't know, 90 Boston butts, and they had a couple Boston butts. They were able to throw on a griddle and warm up and shred it. And um, he just turned, and he said, not only did we serve 4,600 meals, but uh, um, um, I think it was the Red Cross set up. It was some entity set up in that same parking lot. They were feeding 500 meals breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They're going back in October, October 1st, they're going to go back. Um, You guys gave $3,400. It blows me away. It blows me away that this congregation is a very giving congregation, and I thank God for that. They're going back on the 1st. They're going into Houma, Louisiana. That was ground zero. That's what took their direct hit. They were not able to get in there you know, this, this past time because of this, the roads being blocked by trees and debris, but they've cleared it. So they're going in there on the 1st of October. So we're going to be receiving um, more money for that. You've got a couple weeks. I, I ask you to be able to prayerfully consider giving towards that. Um, you know, they're saying that there's over 500,000 people still without power. And in Homa, they're going to go months without any power. You know, the poles are completely snapped in half. They got to put all the infrastructure back in there. 
But there's just something about during difficult times. I'm reminded of Joseph that turned to his brothers and he said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. You know what was amazing? Keith turned to me. He said, Pastor, he said, the craziest thing happened. People were coming up and, and we were giving them meals. They had drive up lines where cars were coming in. They'd say, how many do you need? We need four dinners. And they'd give them four dinners and they would drive off. They had walk up lines. He turned and he said, the people were getting upset with us because they're trying to give us money. They're trying to be able to give us something to, you know, uh, out of appreciation. And he turned and he said, no, 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 this, is, this has already all been paid for. We have other people that have paid for it. And they were in a church parking lot. And the pastor held service out there in that parking lot with no amplification or anything. He held service out in that parking lot for all these people. And what's amazing is that most of the people that were getting that food, they never even knew the church existed. But they do now. And that church, because that church chose to open up their facility for them to be able to be used, that church is going to explode in growth. But what was so awesome, the pastor turned to him and said, no, you need to let these people be able to give. And it may help you to be able to fund the next trip, but they, they're not hurting with the finances. They just don't have some of the, the, the creature comforts like electricity or the ability to be able to cook or, or anything along those lines. So the food that they have is cold food, and here you're giving them hot meals. But he just turned and he said, pastor, he, just, he said, tell your congregation how appreciative you know, we are that they helped support us. And he had businesses all over. So if you've got a business that wants to be able to feed you know, he had businesses that were providing trailers and trucks and foods. And, you know, he's in the construction business. He's a construction engineer to where um, he works for an engineering firm to be able to make sure that the roads that they're building are being built to specs. And so all these, these companies began to, to, to pony up and say, hey, listen, we want to be able to, to, to help these people that are in time of need. But he just wanted me to reiterate to you and those that are online, because I know a lot of money came in online as well, um, just to thank you for your giving. And, uh, and if God speaks to your heart, do you want to be able to give for this next deployment? If you want to go, just let me know. There's room for you to be able to serve. And I'm just here to tell you that you're not going to be staying at no Holiday Inn because there's no Holiday Inn. As a matter of fact, they sleep right in the parking lot that they feed. That's why they only go for two days. And then they have other teams that come in right behind them. And so they're sleeping in their vehicles or they pulled a camper. They had no power in the camper, so they just had a bed to be able to lay down on. Okay, it's rough, but at the same time, you know what? These people are living in the midst of that. So if you want to be able to go, if God speaks to your heart, just let me know. And Keith will have some meetings prior to to kind of instruct you on what is needed. But other than that, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Wasn't God good today?